and Daniel O'Connell. Uh, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, Daniel served churches in Danbury, Connecticut, St. Louis, Missouri, and Houston. He served on various regional and national denominational boards with distinction. He performed the first Midwest public gay wedding in 2003, filing the ceremony with the St. Louis city clerk. In Houston, he merged one strong and two weak churches into one church with three locations and co-founded the UU Voice for Justice, a rapid response social justice network. Over a 20 year plus period in the ministry, he consulted with churches in a variety of roles and was especially interested in staffing administration, fundraising, and conflict resolution. He also helped train a dozen, half dozen or so student ministers, and this helped him develop a systematic approach to team preaching. In early 2018, Daniel realized he was unhappy with certain supervisory parts of ministry and that it was negatively affecting some of those around him. He realized it was time for him to go, and so he left the UU ministry. But now, Daniel enjoys occasional preaching, and we're glad to have him join us for that. And as an independent state licensed broker, he helps people find affordable, comprehensive health insurance. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Daniel O'Connell. Good morning. Good morning. So they teach you in seminary, if you're going to be a real minister, you have to dress funny. So here I am. So um, James Johnson, thanks for that about the hymns. That's, that's really good. And if you look at the words on that particular hymn, um, it sounds along the ages. Well, what is it? Right? So, and it goes through the centuries, through various world religions. It's, it's not God. It's not Jesus. I think it's fresh spiritual insight, which of course is what we're always looking for. And it's interesting to, you know, there was also a mention here about the difference between uh, history and heritage. So it was about 280 years ago last July that the evangelical movement in both the United States and Britain started. And it was very right wing then and had political implications, and it was based on the idea that we are all inherently evil and morally bankrupt. And in the most famous sermon, the one that really kind of launched everything, it was by a guy named Reverend Jonathan Edwards. This would be July 8, 1743. And he says that we are all, without exception, sinners in the hands of an angry God deserving only of eternal torment and damnation, every last one of us. I'll just give you a, a quote. The wrath of God burns against them. That's everybody. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is held over them, and the pit hath opened underneath. The devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment shall God permit this? The devils stand waiting like greedy, hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it, but are for the present kept back. If God should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained, the devils would in one moment pounce upon the poor souls. The old serpent is gaping for them. Hell opens its mouth wide to receive them, and if God should permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. Well, that's pretty vivid. <laughs> I mean, remember, this is 1743, so no TV, no internet. Now, some of you, maybe in the room or on Zoom, may have grown up Unitarian Universalist like I did. So I grew up without the idea that I was a desperate sinner in the hands of an angry God, or that I and most of humanity was somehow justifiably doomed to eternal torment, burning in hell. It wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how many people actually believe that, growing up and as an adult. Kids and adults told on a very regular basis, maybe every Sunday, that they were worthless sinners. And I just couldn't wrap my 
mind around that. I mean, these seemingly normal people had this, to me, bizarre belief. And, you know, you just can't tell by looking at somebody, right? I mean, unless they have one of those red hats or something, I don't know. So I think, especially as children and maybe as adults, but especially as children, there has been more than one time where we felt kind of unworthy. Maybe we were told that by parents or other kids. Perhaps we failed our own expectations about ourselves and what we should do. And then imagine that you were told that there are things you could do so you'd be forgiven for being born unworthy. Well, if there are things you could do, that'd be a pretty powerful incentive, right? I mean, why not try it? And some religions say that everything happens as the will of God, and if you act right, talk right, and give money to the right people, then God will make you rich. I don't know. It seems pretty straightforward. Where do I sign up? It's kind of the old carrot and stick approach. You hit the donkey with a stick to get it to move in the right direction, and you offer a carrot, a treat, to get the donkey to keep moving in the right direction. And so the fear of hell might motivate you to do good deeds, and the promise of everlasting life in heaven might motivate you to keep doing good deeds. I think that's the basic idea. But for a lot of people, back then and now, heaven sounds kind of boring. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you lived in the desert, then a lot of milk and a lot of honey might be appealing, but, you know, really, for how long? I don't know. So heaven sounds a little boring. Hell, hell though as we just heard, is a real nail-biter, a seat gripper. And again, growing up Unitarian Universalist, I had no idea how many people believed in this particular version of heaven and hell. And of course, I think, well, nobody really thinks like that anymore, right? <laughs> so there's this organization, you may have heard of them, called the Gallup Organization. They do a poll. They do a poll every year on pretty much the same questions. And so um, my question was, did they do a poll about hell? I mean, do people today in 2023 still actually believe in an alternate plane of existence called hell where souls burn eternally? And so I go, I go and I take a look, and I'm surprised. Yesterday I looked it up again. It went from 60% of Americans, like 10 years ago, to 59%. Still believe in an alternate plane of existence that souls go to after death. 60, we'll just call it 60%. Now, if you don't believe in an actual location called hell, you are in the minority in this country. I mean, you knew you were in the minority in other ways, but you're really in the minority here. Now, after I became a minister, I began to wonder how many other ministers who aren't universalists and their faith tradition teaches that there's a hell. How many of them actually believe it? And would they be willing to, like, you know, tell a fellow minister the truth? So years ago, I was in St. Louis, and I was at an interfaith meeting, and there were pastors and ministers from Southern Baptist, kind of right-wing even then, Missouri Synod Lutheran, even way more right-wing, United Methodist, depends on the part of the country, uh, UCC, and a couple of Presbyterians too. And I knew I was going to eventually have to preach on this topic, because after all, Unitarian Universalists, you're going to have to say something about hell, even if you don't want to. So uh, when we were doing a check-in before the meeting began, I just quickly said, hey, I'm going to be preaching on this, and I'm just curious, just show of hands, real quick, nobody's going to say anything outside of this room, how many of them actually believed in a literal hell where some souls would go after they died? There were 12 of them there, 12 disciples, a dozen, and then me, right? And out of those 12 ministers, how many hands do you think went up saying they believed in a literal plane of hell? Three. Three. Only three. And that includes some of the most conservative denominations in the United States. So even though for them their official faith tradition says, yes, there is a hell, and most people are going there, 75% of those pastors said they personally didn't think so. Don't quote them. Now, their parishioners do believe in hell, and of course, of those Americans who believe in a literal hell, now remember, that's 59%. Out of those 59% of Americans who believe in a literal hell, what percentage of them do you think they think they're going to hell? Four. Four. That's it. 
The problem with this line of thinking, when you look into what can actually get you into hell, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures and also the Christian Scriptures, if you take the Christian Bible pretty close to literally, it seems fairly obvious that very, very few people are going to heaven after death, even and especially most Christians. The really strict ones believe that almost no one's going to heaven, many in their own church. Yeah, just look around. Who do you think here is, you know, sorry. <laughs> Can I have your car? No one will. So now Paul says that those who are not going to heaven are, it's kind of a long list, I'll just give you the highlights. Those who are not going to heaven are fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. So anyone, and I'm saying you, I'm just maybe somebody you know, anyone who has ever had a lustful thought, premarital sex, ever got drunk, ever got divorced, oops, ever got divorced and remarried, and none of them are going to heaven, but it gets worse. According to Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 2, for those of you who brought your Bibles, um, <laughs> You better hope none of your ancestors did any of those things either, because if they did, children are condemned for their parents' sins to the 10th generation. 10th generation. Now, if you take that list and you extend it 10 generations, every time someone slip up, it's a large list. Your, your, your great, 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 put, put eight greats in front of their grandfather, got drunk one time. Sorry, out you go. And if you add to that list, that big list, the millions of people who lived before Jesus and all the people who are not Christians, and well, heaven, was that a pin drop? Crickets? Yeah, it's going to be a pretty empty place. Now, Orthodox Christians who are up on their theology know this, and it causes them some concern because first they live in fear of their own souls going to hell for eternity, Tertullian, a second century church father, wrote, we Christians make a real effort to attain a blameless life. We do this under the influence of the magnitude of the threatened torment. For it is not merely long enduring, it is everlasting. And they are not just concerned about their own souls going to hell forever, they are worried about other people going there too. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia Chronicles, writes in his book, The Problem of Pain, quote, some will not be redeemed. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power, end quote. Ah, but it is in his power to remove that doctrine from his understanding of God and theology, and that's exactly what the Christian Universalist did. Universalism, as you probably know, is not new. The first widely popular universalist text arguing against the idea that most of humanity would spend eternity roasting in hell was written by Hosea Ballou in 1805. Now, the catchy title of his book is really long, so I'm just going to give you the abbreviated version, which is A Treatise on Atonement in which the finite nature of sin is argued, its cause and consequences as such, the necessity and nature of atonement, and its glorious consequences in the final reconciliation of all men in holiness and happiness. <sighs> so I was surprised that even though this thing is from 1805, it is really much easier to understand than I thought it was going to be. He argues that only God is infinite, so sin cannot be infinite. You could sin for 80 years, not eternity. And another is, is that it makes no sense for God to send one of God's sons to a cross and painful death as a way of making up for all of humanity's sins. All of this was to blue and to me, frankly, 212 years later, quote, unfounded in the nature of reason and unsupported by divine revelation. There are lots of stories of Christians finding it difficult to accept the teachings that they grew up with about hell. In fact, there's probably some of you in this room or online. Now, one of the more intriguing contemporary stories is about a black man who grew up poor in San Diego, California, and he had a big revelation. His life changed, as did the people around him. So Carlton Pearson was featured in an issue of the UU World, and he got a full scholarship to Oral Roberts University. He was a true believer. Now, if you don't know about 
Oral Roberts University. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it is the largest charismatic Christian university in the world. Now, after graduation in the early 1980s, Pearson built a church in Tulsa, which became a megachurch. And the really strange part about this is that plenty of white people went to it, too, in Tulsa. Quote, by the late 1990s, Pearson's church had swelled to 6,000 members who were dropping $60,000 a week into the plate. Pearson had created something unheard of in Tulsa, a multiracial megachurch led by a black man in the sprawling housing developments and malls of white South Tulsa. The young man who grew up poor made it big. But then one day, Pearson was watching a TV news report on the genocide in Rwanda in the mid-1990s. And his daughter asked him something. And he thought of all those unsaved people being murdered by genocide. We're all going to go to hell and burn forever. They didn't have a chance to be saved. And because of that, they were all going to hell. And he began to wonder, would God really do that? And then, boom, the lightning bolt struck. No. God loves everyone, even the unsaved. Well, okay, then it came to him that if God loves everyone, that means everyone. It means Jews, Muslims, gay people, atheists, everyone. It was a stunning revelation. God loves everyone because love is God's essential nature. God loves that guy that cuts you off in traffic. God loves people on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you. God loves drug-abusing alcoholic parents and their children. And unlike some pastors in St. Louis, Carlton Pearson did not keep his revelation to himself. He began to preach what he calls the gospel of inclusion to his 6,000-member church, and he mentioned it on some of his speaking engagements. Wild guess as to what happened. Yeah. Soon the evangelical community, all the big names and all the little names, began to say he'd slipped. He was slippering down that slippery slope to hell himself. All his white folks left, and almost all the black folks too, and from 6,000 he quickly went down to about 200. And he had driven by the big Unitarian Universalist church in Tulsa many times. But now he saw the word universalist in the name. He'd been taught about Unitarians and Universalists at Oral Roberts University. They were some sort of strange cult. But now he knew he was a Universalist, and he saw that sign, and he learned more about it. And then one day, just out of the blue, he and his flock of 200 simply showed up at All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa. I mean, imagine if 20 black people just walked in here right now and sat in your seat. <laughs> You might have mixed feelings about that. And uh, they all joined, and some are still there, but that's another story. It has always been difficult for the Orthodox to consider religion without hell. Sort of a necessary evil, if you will. Many authorities say it isn't absolutely necessary, but most evangelicals still stress it. They believe it prevents the world from slipping into chaos. That whole carrot stick business. Someone confronted a UU minister many years ago and said, you know, without hell, you can do whatever you want. Rape, pillage, steal, kill. And the UU replied, is that what you would do? Really? Steal, pillage, and kill? Is that the only thing holding you back? <laughs> the Orthodox are encouraged to fear God, to seek to avoid hell, to overcome original sin, and to do good works in order to gain heavenly power, get another, another star in their crown. Unitarian Universalists do not do good works in order to gain heavenly favor. Unitarian Universalists are truly good for nothing. <laughs> right? Now, for many UUs, there is a concept of heaven and hell, but not as an alternate plane of existence but it's something that we can create here and now, every day. 
Every day by our actions, we can raise hell or we can create a little bit of heaven for a stranger on the beach or a stranger we may not know yet. And we already know what hell looks like. We are reminded of that in our joys, sorrows, and concerns. But you also know what heaven looks like because the stories of people helping each other and strangers are also out there too. You use act for good because we know that we are all interrelated and to act for the good of others is to act for the good of ourselves. As Martin King put it, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. I believe that when we act for good, we create a little bit of heaven for somebody else. And then that creates a little bit of heaven for us. And if we create a little bit of heaven every now and then, we can ask a bigger question, which is, what would heaven on earth look like for you? Acting for the good of others helps us out. You can check the statistics. Acting for good makes us feel better. It helps us live longer. It sets a good example for anyone who might care to notice, like children, grandchildren, your neighbor. I firmly believe that people with spiritual depth and maturity do good deeds for strangers. To do a good deed for someone you don't know, someone who, someone who probably can't ever help you out, they can never repay your kindness. This, this is a spiritual test. It is a test offered to you every day, every week, every month, every year, and you can't pass the test without taking it. You can ignore it, but you can't pass it until you take it. And if you don't take and pass this test, the test of ha helping out a stranger who can likely never repay you, then you won't advance spiritually the way you probably want to. So here's the test. Sometime this week, you're going to see a stranger or somebody you don't know very well who looks like they might need assistance. And the test is whether or not you pause in the busy schedule of your day and take the opportunity to do a good deed, no matter how small or large, to do a good deed and make a difference in that person's life. That's the test. Unitarian Universalists are not good in general. We're only good in particular, and to be good means to be a doer of good deeds. From civil rights, to helping the needy, to making bowls, to helping people out on the beach, we are not good in general. We are good in the particular actions that we take. Many years ago, I gave this as a spiritual homework, and one of my Connecticut parishioners, on the way home from church, in the rain, saw a man trying to change a tire on the side of the road. Now, the roads in that part of Connecticut are very thin and really don't have shoulders at all, and, you know, it's kind of like here at range, those shoulders get wet. And so, um, although English was not the driver's first language, and the car was filled with children who did not want to get out and stand in the rain while the tire was changed. The man from my church stopped, got out, and helped change the tire. That's a big deal. He didn't have to stop. It was inconvenient. He got wet and cold. His family tried to not complain. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not... What I'm asking you to consider doing this week won't be changing a tire in the rain. It'll be something else. Maybe carrying a stranger's dog stuff for them. Somebody who could never repay you. Now, I do not know what the opportunity or opportunities are that are going to present themselves to you this week between now and next Sunday. But I guarantee you there will be at least one, and it will be immediately obvious to you, ah, this is the test Daniel was talking about. I'm in a hurry. I got some place to go. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. This is the opportunity. I'll take it. I urge you to take it, and there's going to be more than one. So, you know, if it really is an emergency, wait until the next one. But I guarantee you, if you start looking for these, 
if you start looking for these, they are going to pop up. And, they're, and the more you look for them, the more they're going to pop up, just like when you buy a new car, and now you see that car everywhere. And this is the kind of thing we're talking about. And I urge you to take this opportunity to do a small kindness for a stranger, because you will be changed by the experience. You might even come up here next Sunday, light a candle. For then you will know that you did a good deed and you are a person who does good deeds and that you made a difference in a stranger's life. And may it be so. And amen.